This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilder Beasts, we're back. And we're finally talking about pigeons who smuggle diamonds in Africa. All right, let's go. the tiniest podcast studio closet. Our uh, our hopes were rather dashed in the housing market, like a lot of people, <laughs> turns out. Um, so we're still here and I'm still scrunched, but I took the summer off and I dug deep on some really cool news stories. But I've got some information for you guys up here at the top. I have a new format. So instead of three stories every week, I'm going to be focusing on doing one story really right, especially if it's a deeper conversation like the one today. So think like Emily Spinach and feminism or how Jim the Horse got us the FDA. Those longer form stories will just be a single story within an episode for that week, with maybe a silly story thrown in for good measure from time to time. But but if there's a super deep dive on something, um, we're just going to focus primarily on just one story and see how that feels. I'm also doing a Patreon, and I haven't really announced it on the show. Um, It was something I was considering at the end of last year. I got some feedback, and it was really, really positive feedback all around. So I'm going to be doing a Patreon as well, and that includes Patreon-only content for a dollar a month. So y'all will get a link for bonus episodes just for you if you sign up for the Patreon level at a dollar. And there's already a few episodes in the queue already, and there will be at least one episode for you every month. That's just for your ears. So if you like this show and you want a little more, there's a little more waiting for you at the dollar a month level. Um, There's some other cool things over there too, like if you want a shout out on the show and my eternal gratitude and all sorts of things, Um, like for $5 a month, right? Like that's like half a coffee at Starbucks and a whole lot of coffee in my actual house. You get a link for bonus episodes, a shout out, gratitude, all, all that stuff. But what makes this tier pop is that I'm going to write a handwritten note to your parent, guardian, teacher, life partner, today's partner, the guy who filled your gas tank this morning, whoever, about why you should have a domesticated animal of your choosing. (laughs) So this is your time, kids. You want a pony and you want somebody to defend your your choices. I will defend your choice. I will write your parent a letter. Um, I had a friend who wanted me to write a letter to themselves about why they needed more cats. Sure. So you guys... It's for fun. It's not serious. But if you just kind of want that in your pocket, it's something silly. And I'm really proud of that uh, <laughs> that benefit. <laughs> and then if you donate at $10 a month, you'll get the bonus episodes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yous forever. Stickers. Or, okay, a handwritten note for a domesticated or wild animal for your parent, spouse, naysayer in your life. With one exception, spiders, because trauma trumps Patreon tears. Um, but also a monthly Ask Me Anything, and you get to have your own channel where you can do the whole Ask Me Anything thing, chat among other Bewilderbees fans. Um, so go to Patreon and check out the Patreon and see what you can do to help offset the hosting costs and maybe support my coffee habit. Um, and our very first Patreon shout out, it's already here, and I'm so happy about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eternal thank yous. To Paul Chomo. Yes, he's the host of a show that I have shouted out here before because it's just that incredible. The Farman's Podcast. And I know he told me not to shout out the podcast, but it 
really holds a nice space in the animal and nature podcast of sphere. So if you are looking for maybe a companion podcast for this, go and listen to both the Quokka episode, you're welcome. And if you really want to learn and laugh, you should definitely listen to the live stream for the cure number four, where Paul eats very weird things. This is kind of his jam while both educating listeners and raising money for cancer research. He is a gem and he's really provided people like me support, encouragement, and help getting our shows off the ground. And I consider myself one of the luckiest folks ever to have Paul not just lifting up this show, but so many like this that are not backed by big corporations or big podcasts. He's one of the examples that I point to when people ask for good people in this line of work. And he's just the bee's knees, the quack's pouch, the pigeon's preen. Mwah! So thank you so much, Paul, for all you do for, you know, your show and education, but also for the little guys like me. So thank you. It means the world. And I cannot thank you enough. And I just really want to take the time now to get into our first episode. I have missed this. Um, so today we're finally going to talk about the thing I've been hinting at, not so subtly, for months. Mostly because it took me that long to read the book that I got most of the information from <laughs> on, this, on this episode. So we are going to talk about some very flighty, plucky diamond smugglers. We've discussed pigeons before. We've had Shara Mee, the pigeon who saved 194 men in World War I back in episode 7. And my favorite was the Nikola Tesla's fascination with pigeons too, including the love of his life. A pigeon who he thought had laser beams coming out of her eyes just before she died. Tesla was not a healthy person at this point in his life, suffice it to say. Check out episode 30, A Crow Left of the Attempted Murder, for more on this story too. But pigeons are incredibly smart, despite being called rats with wings. I personally think that they are stunning and cool, cheeky, truthfully not dissimilar to doves that you see on peace banners. In fact, they have identical DNA. They just morphed based on their location. A dove is just basically a white pigeon, y'all. I know, cool, right? So pigeons have been used since the early Egyptians as a means of transporting messages, but it's not like the owls in Harry Potter, right? Hey owl, take this thing to Hagrid's hut. Pigeons are excellent at knowing where home is. And while we don't know the mechanism for why they can find home, they just do. But that means that you can only really send a message one way, to one place, home. Not the store, not the neighbor, just home. So really pigeons were used for one-way communication. It was a great way to get a missive out, but not so great for two-way communication. It's really more like a baby monitor. But the pigeon could find home from anywhere. 1,100 miles away? Sure, gotcha. I'll get that letter to your house, but I won't see you again until you make it back to Egypt. Pigeons are so smart that they have been able to correctly identify benign or harmless tumors from cancerous tumors and mammograms. Seriously. If I could just have a pigeon check the imaging of my mammograms every year, that would rock. Little doctor's outfit, little pen, ooh, little teeny stethoscope. He struts in, he's like, cuckoo. <laughs> but I would guess I would need to translate because I don't know if cuckoo is your fine or you're going to die. So with all of that said about pigeons, there are some in Africa's Diamond Coast who are trained to smuggle diamonds to houses. So the pigeons get diamonds tied to their legs, bodies, little pouches, and then they fly them out of mines to their homes where impoverished family members live, where someone hopefully can sell it and get out of not at all what you're imagining when I say the Diamond Coast. You see, the Diamond Coast in my mind is a sparkly, pretty, touristy place with lots of yachts for better or worse. It oozes a feeling of expendable wealth. But what the Diamond Coast really is, is a series of towns that have been overmined by companies like the De Beers Company, a diamond company and others using men and children in these mines. The average life expectancy for these diamond miners is 37. Y'all, I'm 40. 
life expectancy in a place called the Diamond Coast should not be 37 years old, but it is. And because these diamond digging companies lock everything down, the people who live in these towns where diamonds are plentiful, and we will get back to the plentiful bit shortly, they have in many cases no running water, no electricity, no gas for their cars. They are essentially held hostage by these companies, often after losing fingers or worse if they touch or steal diamonds like it's a mafia. It's, it's Hotel California. Once you check in, you can never leave. And people are only really allowed in if the area becomes overmined. And then people like the reporter who wrote this book that I'm going to cite at the end of today's piece, people like him can go in. But if the diamonds are rocking, don't come a knocking because there is serious humanitarian abuses going on. So where do the pigeons come in? Well, here's the thing. It doesn't have to be this way. These diamonds are so plentiful. Companies like the De Beers Diamond Company purposefully hold back the number of diamonds just to make it seem like there are not a lot. All of this is so that way they can sell them at a much higher cost. It's really gross, honestly. So say I have 100 bananas and I sell them at a dollar each. In order to make the same amount of money on fewer bananas, I would have to sell 25 bananas for $4 each or four bananas for $25 each. That's a lot of moolah for one banana, right? So De Beers has figured out that if they just put fewer diamonds out in the market, they can charge thousands of dollars for a diamond, something that is plentiful. But they want you, yes you listener, to think it's rare. So you know how they say that a diamond is forever? Well, it's because they're banking on you believing it. Because if you try to sell that diamond, it's not worth very much. There is no way that you would get the same amount of money back or even close to it if you sold your diamond ring, necklace, or yes, I've seen these when shopping for my newborn baby, diamond encrusted binkies, pacifiers, suckers, whatever, covered in diamonds. For the teething infant who has everything in your life, diamonds are forever. Luckily, sucking on passies are not. Meanwhile, in Diamond Coastland, if people are just diving underwater or see a diamond in the ground and just bend over to pick it up, investigate it in any meaningful way, like, hey, this shiny rock, that's pretty cool, they can be arrested or worse just for touching the diamond to see what it was. This is so, so dark, and I'm so, so sorry. But that said, there are kids who work in these mines who have figured out that they can raise homing pigeons. The pigeons will always find their way home using like pigeon magic or something, just like they did for early Egyptians, just like they did in World War I to help soldiers communicate, just like they did to announce the winners of ancient Olympic games, just like they have done for centuries for Genghis Khan. Probably not for Napoleon, though some would like to think that the winner of Waterloo was announced to London, England by Pigeon Post, which wasn't really in use in 1815, but was in full swing in the 1820s. So maybe not Napoleon, but definitely Genghis Khan and all of his other cons. No one knows exactly how pigeons do it. Is it a magnetic field? Is it psychic? Is it internal Google Maps? I'm lost. Pigeon, turn left at the second oak tree. Recalculating. Now go up to the maple and do a U-turn. Not only can pigeons find home reliably, but they can do it blindfolded. I, I don't know. They just do. It's so cool. So these mine workers will, in many cases, sneak their pigeons into their lunch boxes. If there's a good opportunity to get a few dirty diamonds into the pigeon's pouch, they release the pigeon and the pigeon flies home with the loot. These are uncut diamonds. They're uncut because, well, they're not really refined or exactly what you're picturing as what you're accustomed to seeing in Jerry Kay and De Beers commercials. Now, this is incredibly risky. If a guard were to see a pigeon, regardless if they're packing diamonds or not, they are instructed to shoot them on sight. And that's awful. But desperate times call for desperate measures. And these people and the pigeons are really desperate. So that two month salary rock someone in your life is wearing? Hi, waving. If someone in the Diamond Coast were to sell that uncut diamond on the black market, 
are somehow beyond all likelihood get a buyer for an illegal diamond, they can make a whopping 37 cents. Cents. As in, not even a dollar. The De Beers company has a great PR team that says things like, well, if you people sell illegal diamonds because they're ours, 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 we'll just use the people that we put in government to pull all the taxes out of your infrastructure. Do you like roads? Do you like schools? Hospitals? Too bad, we want our diamonds. So this is where you can insert the gif of Scrooge McDuck diving into a room of gold or an evil laughing villain. I'm sure you have a go-to. Yeah, just mentally put that here. So while De Beers and other companies say that they're doing good things to the people of the towns that they're mining, they are not actually giving anything meaningful back, especially as they continue to take from the land. Thanks, colonialism. And they also do not allow the community who lives in these towns have any access to their actual land. Thanks. I hate it. So the PR company, according to the book Flight of the Diamond Smugglers by Matthew Gavin Frank, quote, to that end, offshore the De Beers ship Peace, spelled P-E-A-C-E, you know, as in doves of peace, to that end, offshore, the De Beers ship Peace of Africa, which cost 1.1 billion South African rand, and has a life expectancy of 30 years, only seven years less than the average diamond miner, penetrates the seabed with a big drill, sucking up the sediment with a dredge pump into the bowels of the boat. De Beers hopes that the Peace of Africa will reap an average of 240,000 carats per year until the ship dies. I think they expect the same from their miners. Back to the quote. On the ship's deck, A man with an automatic gun scouts the sky. If he sees a pigeon, its body will soon plop into the ocean with hardly a splash. If a pigeon is spotted near the boat, these boys and men will be interrogated at the end of the shift. The less experienced will be fired, the more experienced will be retained, but not before undergoing a more unofficial kind of punishment. Severed human fingers when tossed overboard also hardly make a splash. The tourism office for one of these mining towns, Port Nolith, which is in the desert, has a De Beers outpost, which is cheekily called Captain's Corner. According to the tourism department, the De Beers Captain's Corner is behind a high security fencing with a sign that says, Diamonds are not forever. This supply is expected to run out and an alternative source of income will be needed for the region. Again, It's not exactly the pleasant tourist destination I had in mind when I first read the phrase Diamond Coast. This sounds more like hell. But at the heart of this, people are trying to find ways to survive a greedy company that has effectively taken everything they could from the land. And with it, the humanity. And what do people do? They look to animals to save them, to help them, to partner with them. One boy, as a 13-year-old, has trained his pigeon, and I'd argue his friend, Bartholomew, his literal ride or die, as the pigeon rides in the kids' lunchboxes to go to the mines undetected and smuggles out uncut diamonds. And when the diamonds do make it home, they're going to be used to help his family pay for the kids' own medical bills. See, as a kid, he's already suffering for miner's lung. It's a condition where someone ends up coughing up blood from the diamond dust cutting into his lungs when he breathes and the toxic air underground day after day after day. Bartholomew the Pigeon is his lifeline, his insurance policy, his friend. And this pigeon, given that the guards go house to house to kill pigeons on sight because they know miners are using them to smuggle out a 37 cent diamond, this precious, precious diamond that is essentially a worthless lump of compressed carbon. But due to marketing and exploiting the people of the region, Harvesting the land for all it's worth and leaving both humans and land husks of themselves to rot when they unceremoniously leave, these pigeons need the humans to protect them at all costs too. So rats with wings? I'd argue no. For starters, well, rats are also really freaking smart and incredibly trainable, sweet, and make lovely companions. At least the domestic ones. I wouldn't really recommend going outside and trapping a sewer rat, bringing it home, and begging your parents to let you keep it. That's not going to fly. 
ew. But rats are smart, pigeons are smart, and more importantly for some of those pigeons, they are real life angels. They are lifelines and in some cases the only comfort to have in the worst imaginable conditions possible. So what does that mean? Should we stop buying diamonds? I mean, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I have one that my husband got for me for our engagement. I love it. But I didn't know any of this. I think by putting places like De Beers on blast for these practices and getting awareness out on these atrocious conditions, practices and making different choices, not buying into this, but if all the diamond diggers were to leave tomorrow, these towns would still suffer because they have been taken for everything they have and they would still be in bad shape. The people at the heart of this, the people who love the pigeons, who love their home, who have been beaten down by the greed of the diamond companies, including De Beers, will be in a boat without a rudder, without the companies at all. So there has to be a better way. I I just don't know what that is. So we'll do what we can. We can educate and learn about it, I guess, and think of Mzizi, the child at 13 will likely not make it to 40. And think about Bartholomew, who will very likely not have a long lifespan either. But they have each other. And think about what choices you can make. Where you can put your money and do the best good. Not just for the most shiny, the most pretty, the most De Beers-y. I mean, who's to say that De Beers, who started a diamond tradition in the 30s with a, and I'd be lying if I didn't say it was effective, a very effective ad campaign saying, You need a diamond to propose to your love, and while you're at it, spend a whole month's salary. And when profits were a bit down, De Beers changed it. Two months. And we bought it. Y'all, why did we do that? So instead of gifting your beloved with a diamond, I would say buy her a homing pigeon. Name it De Beers Sucks or something clever. I'm recording in an airtight closet, so my brain isn't exactly on point right now, but you could start a new tradition. Ooh, something that really is forever. A matching tattoo, just not your beloved's name. Our divorce rate in this country is pretty high, and as a tattoo enthusiast, you don't want to pull a Johnny Depp who famously changed Winona Ryder's name that he had inked on his body to Wino Forever. Stroke of genius, for sure, but maybe not something to aspire to. Ooh, I've got it. Matching tattoos of a pigeon, a pigeon named Diamond. That'll do two things. It'll show De Beers and other diamond companies that maybe we shouldn't be killing people, birds, the land, towns, people, humanity, and getting away with it for murder for profit. Ooh, and we can put that money into a tattoo artist's pocket. Support local artists and look up what you can do to support the areas ravaged by greed like the Diamond Coast. And while we're at it, can we stop on the pigeon hate? Next time you see them, don't think of them as rats with wings. <coughs> Ex-boyfriend. Think of them as uncut doves that just need to be cleaned up. They really are a product of our humanness. Just dumping them out when they were unwanted and they found a way to survive despite and because of us. And they deserve way more respect. Ooh. And one last fact that I wasn't sure where to put, but it totes just blew me away. You know dodos? The very example we give as an idiom as if to say no more, cease to live, extinct, gone the way of the dodo, blah, blah, blah. Yo, dodos were pigeons. It's theorized that they flew off course or maybe on course. There's no way to know. Humans weren't around to see them. And when humans were around to see them, we, well, we turned them into the dodos we know and love today. Extinct. We made them extinct in the 1600s before we even knew what extinct really was. But they got to an island in the Indian Ocean. It was paradise. There were no known predators, so they didn't need to fly. So they lost the ability to fly, developed a giant beak, and grew really freaking big. Like, you know, pigeons, right? Small little guys eat crackers. The racing pigeons are about 200 to 400 grams for a medium-sized pidgey. These guys... They are the Starbucks venti of pigeons. They are a whopping 40 pounds. According to the weightofthing.com, that's equal to a female bulldog, five gallons of water, a small sack of potatoes, an elephant's heart, a bushel of gooseberries, an average human leg, a light truck tire, an SUV tire, eight gallons of paint, 
and I'm going to add in the size of my medium dog, Captain Love, pod dog reporting for duty at about 45 pounds. There are 300 kinds of pigeons, and many of them are stunning. I put one on Twitter over the summer. He's a Nico Bar pigeon, and very unlike the ones that you're accustomed to, like, shooing away on the streets of Jersey, these pigeons are gob-smackingly beautiful. They, they have this gray head with super long feathers that fade into bright emerald greens, tropical oranges, iridescent blues, bright purples, and sunset reds. This bird is a walking audition for RuPaul's Drag Race. There's the bleeding heart pigeon who, well, he's bluish gray, pigeon looking, but has a bright white chest and what appears to be a giant blood red spot where the heart should be. It's like evolution was just bopping out to the Bon Jovi song Shot Through the Heart while creating this little bugger. Stunning bird, but the name is a bit on the nose. So the next time you pop the question, consider doing something different to express your love. Maybe a ring of a different gemstone. My bestie Lindsay has a stunning blue rock that, well, I'm, I'm not a gemologist, but it's really pretty and it sticks out because it's not traditional. I have a beautiful diamond ring given to me by my husband, Brian, that I will cherish forever and ever, truly. And every time I look at it, it brings me joy. But knowing what I know now, after learning about these pigeons, I think I'm going to make different choices going forward about where I get my blingy bling. And I think it'll be really important to talk about how something so traditional is based in colonialism, anti-environmentalism, and patriarchal norms that destroy literally everything from the environment, humans, countries, and continents all for a common rock that has really, really, really good PR. Now, I'm off to get my pigeon tattoo. And if you get a pigeon tattoo, which, unlike the De Beers slogan, actually is forever, it can be modified. Consider getting a rock pigeon instead of a rock on your finger. Because if you do end up divorced, you could easily turn it into a bleeding heart pigeon with the right artist. Now that's something you can't do with a diamond. So thank you for joining me back on our first episode of Season 2 of Bewilderbeasts. If you like this show, consider supporting it on Patreon. Again, you get all the bonus content for as little as a dollar a month and all sorts of really fun stuff up to $10. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who helped humans, or other crushingly depressing stories that started off sounding like they were really really cool but it's actually like a really deep dive into like everything that's wrong with humanity send it in (laughs) there are multiple ways to send in your stories ideas or whatever and let me know what you think of this show email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com bewilderedpod on twitter dm or voice text on bewilderbeastpod on facebook or lurk bewilderbeasts on instagram And for those at the $10 a month level, join the private community on Reddit. There you can ask me anything, pick a show topic that we will cover within reason, and join other folks in the community who are just as nerdy about these animals as, well, we all are. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, author of Considerations for the City Dog. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Just the Zoo of Us on Pigeons, Varmints on Pigeons, Adam Ruins Everything on Diamonds, AllAboutBirds.org, PigeonControlResourceCenter.org, WeightOfThing.com, TheSpruce.com, and I cannot thank Matthew Gavin Frank for being so vulnerable and open in his book, Flight of the Diamond Smugglers. It's a really hard book to read. I think it's an important book to read. Um, If you're a kid, I would maybe not read it. There's a lot of adult content Um, especially about loss of pregnancy and um, some of the horrible things that humans are capable of doing to other humans and animals. But if this was an interesting topic for you to hear about today, I would encourage you trying to track down that book, Flight of the Diamond Smuggler by Matthew Gavin Frank. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week.